Sure. Well, you know, I, probably the one way to look at it, or at least the way that I look at it, is that X MOOCs and C MOOCs address different knowledge needs. And so an X MOOC, as an example, is looked, uh, looks at what is known in a discipline already and then helping others get sort of a foundational knowledge in that area. Whereas a CMOOC is more interested in generative approaches to knowledge, you know, creativity, developing, learning new things, or uh, new things for a discipline, uh, as an example. So I think in that regard, if we look at them not as in competition, but as serving two entirely different knowledge needs, then I, I wouldn't look at them as necessarily being in conflict. Creating a hybrid model of the two, I think there, it'd be interesting. I, I think there's some level at which, even in our learning experience, we're always moving from acquiring knowledge, like what does someone else know or what's known in a field, to trying to generate something, to acquiring and so on. So I would say if you're looking at a bachelor's degree, and there's two approaches, so I'm going to first provide sort of one view and then I'll just give us, just at the end, just to invalidate that, give a secondary view. But uh, so in a, when we start as students in university as a, at a bachelor's level, there are many things that we have to learn. You know, we have to learn uh, how to name biological entities. We have to learn basic theorems in, in uh, math. We have to learn basic ideas in physics. So I think in that regard, we're always acquiring or duplicating knowledge of others when we first start in an entirely new knowledge space. So it's possible that if you have a, a, an a, a learning design model that begins by providing what is known in this field and then adds once a bit of a foundation is laid then adds in the next level of what can what can you create based on what you know then there's a possibility to blend those two so that's the one view now as a slightly contradictory view uh, the work of Carl Breider who's written extensively on knowledge in, in sort of today's society and, and knowledge economy he would argue that even at a very very young level even students in the primary and secondary school system should be knowledge generators not knowledge duplicators and even if we're learning something that is already known by others in the field pedagogically the way we should acquire it is not through instructivist means but more through active and engaged learning so that's a, just a bit of a secondary point to my answer well that's that's I think a challenge and it's it's certainly not just French culture we I think almost globally the school system has been designed to be top-down and that I think reflects various attributes of government and just the organization of society as a whole. I don't know what it'll be like in the future uh, but there are a few examples of this already in knowledge generation in society today. So a few illustrations would be what's happened with the social movement societally, how people organize without organizations. And they do this through, essentially through social media and through being connected to one another. And if you consider the organizational structure, even of, of a company that's very hierarchical, that has a very traditional management layer down to employees, even in those organizations, if you do an analysis of the social network of that organization, you'll find that knowledge in that company doesn't flow the way that the uh, chart, the, the organizational chart flows. Instead, people are connected across different spaces and you could have one person that could be critical to the flow of knowledge in, let's say, one department. And let's, she might not even be the leader of that department, she's just someone who's very well connected. So I think in that regard, it's worth realizing that even now, even though if French culture is very structured and hierarchical, the flow of information and ideas is likely more networked. And I think that's a transitory period in society where in the past, when geography was important and when we had certain structures to government, then, we, and much like if you read, let's say, the development of the Roman structure of organizing society, which influences many developed economies today, that was, you needed that hierarchical model in order to be able to manage remote regions of your empire. Well, today, we have different capacities to communicate. You don't need that kind of staged or structured model remotely where you have the hub at the center. Instead, you get a very flattened society and a flattened organization. But we're still experimenting. We haven't figured out what does this look like? How do we make this a part 
of our entire functioning as a society and that'll take us time to absorb to the sense where we recognize even now if you one illustration is the Obama presidency they've experimented with social media and network technologies to connect with the electorate first of all for being elected they've also made attempts to try and allow citizens voices through petitions online to gain some traction so those have been attempts, they're, but they're very young attempts, and there's a lot of negative in some cases that's come out of it, but I think it's an indication of a, a way of thinking about governance that gives greater credit to the voices at, the, uh, at the, what's currently viewed as being the, the lower tier of the societal model. How does that relate to MOOCs? I think it's the way that we transition in information flow in society as a whole, how we communicate with one another, eventually is reflected in the way we teach and in the way we learn. And so the hierarchical structured society will become more amenable to see MOOCs, if you will, as those technologies make a bigger impact in society. Well, I, you know, MOOCs in my eyes are, are a trend that's sort of at its current stage. And, and what I mean with that is that right now we're using the word MOOC to describe a lot of trends. So MOOCs, I think, are less a, an idea and more a lens to view a whole sequence of changes. And these changes are, are there many different components to it. On the one hand, we're seeing more of a knowledge need in society, more jobs are, are knowledge based. We're seeing the development of greater quantities of technology in all aspects of our lives. We're seeing uh, the, the growth of analytics with data as a way of interacting with information with one another, openness in education, uh, some of the economic change pressures. So there's a huge range of trends happening. And MOOCs are a reflection of those trends, but also a lens through which we can view those trends. So from that end, the general idea of a MOOC, not the name, so if we can separate the name MOOC from the idea that MOOCs reflect, the name is going to probably have a shorter shelf life. It's, it's something that now gains attention because people can understand what a MOOC is. Politicians, journalists, people in society, in many parts of the world, they've heard of MOOCs. Now, less have heard about advanced pedagogical techniques or less of, so the, there's this distinction that it's a buzzword that captures people's attention. And that's a good thing, I think, because there are more people talking about education now than, than at any point that I can recall in recent memory. So from that end, MOOCs are very important because they're going to, the word, they're going to raise the profile of discussion around uh, education in our society today. The more important trends that MOOCs reflect, those are going to have a longer trajectory. And what I mean with that is that even if the buzzword of MOOCs in five years' time is replaced with a new word, then those words will still demonstrate the progression of these factors societally that are driving forward with a new education model. What I think in the future, though, is that the university itself will undergo some fairly dramatic changes. It will, my argument at least, is that the university is a reflective entity or will become reflective of the complexification of society as a whole. And so that means universities, if university leaders have a vision and are able to properly execute that vision, universities in the future will be much better integrated in society. It won't be a place that we'll go to for four years or six years when we're younger and then get into the workforce. Instead, it will be a place that will be integrated with all aspects of what we do for lifelong learning, life-wide learning. It will be a part of our society the way that many other institutions are right now, integrated within our society, you know, social or cultural institutions. <laughs>